From the Lean Enterprise Institute in Boston, this is the WLEI Podcast, where we share stories of people making the world better through lean thinking and practice. For more information about LEI, including how we can help you apply lean thinking, please visit lean.org. Welcome to the WLEI Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Savas. Today, we're talking to Otto Funke and Joseph Tamayo from Global Foundries, an industry leader in semiconductor manufacturing. Otto has been practicing lean since the early 2000s and has been overseeing strategy deployment for the Global Foundries manufacturing site named Fab9 for 16 years. Joseph began his career at Global Foundries as an operator in 2018 and now plays a key role in technical training. Over the course of the conversation, they'll share Fab 9's strategy deployment process, particularly how they align strategic objectives to frontline work and methodically develop the next generation of leaders along the way. Otto and Joseph will be leading a learning session at LEI's Lean Summit in March 2024 in Carlsbad, California. Head over to lean.org summit to learn more and register by October 31st to save up to $900 on your registration. Now let's kick things off with Otto and Joseph. Welcome to the WLEI podcast. Today, we're discussing semiconductor manufacturing and the principles of lean transformation, specifically strategy deployment. And joining us for the discussion is Otto Funke and Joseph Tamayo from Global Foundries, a global leader in semiconductor manufacturing, who will also be joining us at LEI's Lean Summit in March next year. Uh, Otto and Joseph, thanks for joining me here on the podcast. Thank you for having us. Hi, Matt. It's great to be with you. To get things started, um, we'll just do a little bit of background here. So um, like I said, Global Foundries, big uh, semiconductor manufacturer, but um, Otto, could you care to uh, just elaborate on on what the company what the company does and specifically the uh, facility where you work at Fab9 in um, just outside Burlington, Vermont? Hi, Matt. As the name implies, Global Foundries is a global semiconductor manufacturing foundry. We've got operations in Singapore, in Dresden, Germany. Um, We're expanding operations in France, and we've got semiconductor uh, manufacturing in Malta, New York, and then our location known as Fab 9 in Essex Junction, Vermont, sometimes referred to as Burlington. We receive designs from customers, and we build Uh, their designs using our technologies and we serve a wide variety of um of markets and uh what what do you what's your responsibility inside fab nine auto my responsibility i work in the what we call the module engineering organization uh, manufacturing engineering and my particular role is primarily to teach and coach structured problem solving and i'm the fab nine business process uh, owner for the strategy deployment process. Okay. And then Joseph, uh, you joined Global Foundries in 2018. So you've been with the company for uh, five years or so. And uh, similarly, can you share what are, you, what, are you, what are your responsibilities at Fab9? De- definitely. Uh, thank you for having us as well. And um, uh, my roles and responsibilities within the company are, uh, so uh, one of them would be uh, onboarding people. So we would teach classes to ensure that employees are ready whenever they step inside the fab. So uh, just like any other companies, uh, we have terminologies that people outside the company might not necessarily recognize. So we would teach that, um, again, to ensure that they know that whenever an experienced individual within the company talks to them, they're on the same page. Uh, We also do uh, TWI classes, uh, training within the industry. So, and that's to help uh, to ensure our trainers know how to train new employees uh, within the company. Uh, it's important because everyone has to do it the same way, right? Because if everyone is doing it differently, then there's no standard within the company and that doesn't really fly too well. So yeah, we help uh, with a lot of training uh, and we do a lot of classes to ensure uh, that employees are aware of what's new, what's uh and what needs to happen. And uh, just a little bit more background. Otto, you've been doing this stuff for quite a while before we hopped on the podcast here. You mentioned that you've been 
doing what uh, used to be described as Japanese manufacturing in the 80s. But um, can you kind of walk us through your lean journey, as it were, or your history with all this stuff? Uh, sure. I joined the, this location when we were previously owned and operated by IBM in 1991. We've been acquired by Global. Global Foundries in 2015. Uh, I would say that my lean journey in using the term of lean manufacturing started primarily in about 2004 when IBM Microelectronics decided that uh, we were going to uh, initiate a lean transformation uh, at this location and subsequent at several other locations and have been a practitioner and a student of so-called lean transformation, uh, primarily problem solving PDCA skills. Uh, and all of the uh, associated um, uh, tools and skills uh, that come along with that since about 2004. Okay, and um, earlier you mentioned that you're now overseeing strategy deployment at the facility, speaking of tools, and that's specifically what you're going to be talking about or leading a learning session on at our summit next March. Uh, can you share exactly, you know, how does Fab9 use that device of strategy deployment and the process behind it? Sure. We studied with uh, Pascal Dennis starting in about 2008 from his book, Getting the Right Things Done. And we hired him to come and teach us how to use strategy deployment. And we've been using it at the um, enterprise level, at, the, at least at this locations level since then. We've had a variety of uh, successes with it. We've also had some less than successful uh, uses of it over the years. And since uh, 2019, we've been on a pretty good run uh, of using the strategy process uh, at the uh, general manager level, who's the, the, mm. the most senior manager at the site level. So uh, I work with the general manager and his direct reports to operate the PDCA cycle in the context of uh, strategy deployment. There are a few key principles of strategy deployment. One of them is alignment. So you're trying to connect horizontally different functions inside of an organization so that they're aligned on goals and then vertically so that things goals, objectives decided at the top actually cascade down to the to the floor. Um, how, how is it how does alignment work in that in that process? What's your what's your method for developing alignment around strategic goals for the organization? As I mentioned, the uh, when we run strategy deployment at the at the enterprise level, it is with the general manager and all of his senior executives that mm -hmm. represent the functional portions of the organization, but that's not how we arrange the strategy. We arrange a strategy deployment based on a balanced scorecard. Uh, the elements of our balanced scorecard include safety, quality, cost, delivery, team, and value. Um, we do score ourselves on those elements uh, as part of our reflection each year going into a strategy deployment cycle. Uh, and then as we reflect on the imperatives from the previous year's strategy cycle, we develop um, the upcoming year's uh, requirements. And they're really at a matrix level responsibility. So we end up with uh, three or four strategic imperatives that are not functionally organized, but are uh, built around, again, that concept of the balanced scorecard. So, for example, we might have a, uh, a quality initiative that has uh, accountability and responsibility outside of just the yield engineering organization or just out, outside of just the, uh, uh, the quality organization and will typically require participation from um, senior leaders and working level people in different organizations. So you asked about alignment that process of developing those strategic Im imperatives each year and then um, matrixing them through the, the specific actions necessary to achieve them uh, generates that alignment that you, that you asked about. Mm. And then Joseph, as somebody who's, you know, previously you worked on the production floor level. So, mm -hmm. and now working in a training capacity, 
how does the strategic initiatives how does that how does that uh, come down from top kind of general management level down to the floor level how do you feel that connection as an operator and now as a somebody leading training right um i think we see that as uh, uh as you mentioned earlier alignment i think it's important that uh i think what it does is that it brings the two groups into the same perspective right because um uh, from like a leadership perspective they might have a different way of describing things that might mm. that in operations le level they might not see it necessarily as clear as they do uh within the leadership so i think it's it's that communication that they do whenever uh whenever they they relay that message it it, it eventually uh i guess the message would be it gets translated throughout to ensure that that it goes that that the changes applies into operations and not just like a, a big idea so it, it it gets broken down into small different pieces uh so they have a better understanding of of what leadership is trying to uh implement right because a lot of times if Leadership just says, hey, this is what's happening. There's no big why as to like why that is happening. Mm. So there is that that communication uh, that goes into operations. And then to kind of make this a little bit more concrete right now, we're talking at a pretty conceptual level. Um, Otto, is there um, a particular problem or initiative this year uh, that you guys are focused on? That maybe Joseph can explain how that actually breaks down at, at an operations level, the, the, the specific problem a, a, a supervisor or operator is trying to solve. But is there a large, large scale problem that you guys can share? Sure. Let me go back and uh, add to your question to Joseph. How do the um, strategic imperatives cascade to the employees? Mm. There's two specific tools in the uh, that, that we use one of them is uh the annual um performance goal setting um process in the january time frame uh each employee writes performance objectives and then they're reviewed with their manager so certainly the strategy imperatives uh are part of that goal setting process um there's another element where uh, and we've been particularly good at it in the past year is all employee communications so uh, we have what we call town hall meetings and for example this year back in march after we had finished the strategy a3 um, we conducted uh, town hall meetings for all of the shifts we run four manufacturing shifts two day shifts and two night shifts that covers 24 hours by seven days a week and so we ran um town hall meetings for each of those shifts and explicitly brought the every employee through the strategy exactly the mm. uh, the left hand side of the strategy what our reflection was from the previous year and the right hand side of the strategy what the uh, specific imperatives are for 2023 uh, and the specific actions and measurable targets for each of those actions we don't get into every single line item of detail uh, but the imperative leaders do talk about um, the broad themes and how those uh, um, are aligned again back to your question about alignment so mm. um is there a specific problem uh that we've been focused on well uh i could tell you that there are four particular imperatives that we're working on in 2023 include um sustaining and improving our process yield uh they include sustaining and improving our cost structure they include a um, very specific new technology development that we're pursuing uh, that's called um, gallium nitride or GAN and a very specific focus on sustaining and improving uh, employee engagement and you might use the overall term morale um, as a strategic imperative. So those are the four primary uh, imperatives that we've been carrying in 2023. Okay, so... First, you have uh, a couple of mechanisms. You describe the, the employee performance uh, goal setting. So, so objectives that each individual has are tied to presumably those goals, those four strategic initiatives you just outlined, or the ones that that match 
what the employee is is doing? Yeah, so the annual performance objectives are usually um, formed more as a result of the functional organization that the employee is a part of. Mm, so okay. there may be requirements, there may be performance objectives that are very specific to that organization that may not have been explicitly called out in the strategy A3, but also though those that are uh, will get called out. So um, everybody should have a line of sight either through their annual performance objectives or through participating in the town hall meetings, what the how they contribute to the strategy uh, and the uh, um, the activities that are associated with those imperatives through the course of the year. Now, I mentioned that we do those town hall meetings in March timeframe. We've just completed a cycle of those meetings actually last week where we did a follow-up because part of our strategy deployment process is a mid-year check and adjust. And following that mid-year check and adjust, we then give another readout to the entire team, uh, each of the four manufacturing shifts, uh, as well as the people that work, um, you know, sort of like Monday through Friday, the, the support organizations. Um, all of those folks got another update on how are we doing to our uh, imperatives and uh, measurable targets to the specific actions associated with those imperatives. That that whole part of it, it it's maybe sounds a little meta, um, is directly related to the um, employee experience and trying to make sure that the the team understands, you know, what the directions are. That the team understands how well we're working towards those imperatives and what progress we've made. So we've got uh, a really pretty high degree of transparency as to the um, organization's position and how we're performing against those objectives. And then Joseph, towards the goals or the initiatives that Otto just outlined, what is your role in that, uh, in either a training capacity or, or just supporting driving those initiatives? So in that case, um, just like what Otto mentioned, uh, so whenever new technologies roll out, like GAN, uh, for example, uh, so uh, in that case, whenever they have, they do have that technology, we would provide that training to ensure that employees know how to handle. So uh, we work with microchip and uh, those microchips, they're very fragile. So we have to ensure that employees know how to handle it properly uh, with extra care and what equipment to use, for example, uh, what type of carts it can be on, uh, how to handle the uh, cassettes uh, in a specific manner to ensure that uh, we provide quality work at the end of the day. So uh, employees are able to, or the leadership is able to provide that information like Otto mentioned during town hall meetings um, to say that, yeah, within this uh, quarter, you know, there hasn't been a quality event. Uh, and that's uh, that's how that's reflected, and that's how employees contribute is to uh, ensure that quality work has been provided, and to ensure that training happens, and that employees fully understand that uh, this is a new technology, and that it's something that we're progressing, so we can start producing more of it. Joseph, nice. can that's I make a suggestion? Mm -hmm. would, would you consider telling Matt about your technical training teams strategy A three? and what that process has been like for you, because I think that you know, will expand on answering that question. Definitely. Um, so within uh, the, the beginning of this year, uh, Matt, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, we started an A3 as well for our training team because of the new uh, workload that we have uh, taken on. And in this case, um, our strategy is you know, to uh, ensure that certifications are uh, up to date, uh, the onboarding to ensure that that's smooth and the other areas that we are trying to improve such as uh, visuals like using power bi as a new tool uh, to see the the training content that we have provided this year um, so those kinds of data and also not only that so let's say uh for example admin administrative um, skills not everyone would be on the same skill level and whenever there's a new increase in workload, then that means you have to have uh, more people that are skilled uh, to, to handle those, uh, let's say, uploads or fixes. So it's not only that things needs to be fixed, but also the skills that you need to bring people, uh, the level of skill that you need to bring people up to. 
so now that you know you've defined the workload how do you handle that and that's uh one thing that we tackled in re3 is the the skills the administrative skills that the people can do and the new things that we're learning within the team um so in this case uh like training standards for example uh in that case whenever we're working with not necessarily a new department but in areas that we're not really sure where i would say the standards are not quite clear you know in that case we would gather set up a team find out what's the existing process how can we improve it and how do we want it to look like uh th so whenever we uh encounter those kind of topics we do put put a team together and see how how uh we can handle those so that's how we uh implemented the a3 at the beginning of this year as well okay, and matt, matt if i could just clarify um sure. joseph's team for the first time this year created a strategy a3 specifically for their department mm -hmm. uh, their department is uh i think up to 10 manufacturing operators and earlier in the year they were confronted with um a significant amount of requests from organizations outside of manufacturing to help them with training. And so they used the strategy A3 process to, uh, just as we do at the enterprise level, identify what their primary um, objectives were and then um, developed specific activities. Joseph is referring to several of those specific uh, imperatives in the strategy A3 um, to be able to uh, bring some of those other organizations, not manufacturing, but other organizations on site, um, you know, into the, the scope and the skills that they provide uh, as technical trainers. So uh, again, you asked about alignment um, in, in one of your previous questions. That was an opportunity for them to get together with their stakeholders and their requesters and make sure that they had good alignment. So, um, and I'll also brag on Joseph's uh, accomplishments. He's being, I think, a little bit too, uh, um, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, he, he specifically and his counterpart, Pima Lama, are the ones who have facilitated and created the strategy A3 for their department as well. So uh, whereas I may do that at the enterprise level, they learn the skills and are deploying the skills of how hmm. to do that uh, at their department level. Hmm. And so th that's happening uh, following the creation of the enterprise objectives, Otto, or concurrently with the creation of those objectives? To ensure that I think it out. happened, you know, I, th I think but time wise, it, I think it happened subsequent to mm -hmm. that. Uh, there are several other organizations, uh, departments, uh, at least two other departments, three other departments that I can think of that took advantage of the strategy A3 process subsequent to putting together the enterprise level yeah. um, strategy A3 as well. So, yes. you know, to me, the key point is, is that it's a scalable process. This is part of what we'll talk about uh, in yeah. the um, in the summit in, in March is, is that the, the process is quite scalable and it's effective in developing um, sort of higher order employee skills. Uh, again, Joseph's being, um, um, he's, not, he's not telling you as much of the things that he's been doing personally and, and expanded beyond, uh, you know, his own uh, previous experience now he's facilitating he's leading uh pdca activities uh, all as uh you know as, as outcomes uh, of the strategy deployment process so we'll get back to the interview in just a moment are you struggling to implement change inside your organization then join us at the 2024 lean summit in carlsbad california on march 19th and 20th with optional workshops on the 21st and 22nd Dive deep into the transformative power of Lean and immerse yourself in inspiring keynotes and practical learning sessions. This year's theme is Shaping Tomorrow, Developing People and offers game-changing insights and actionable strategies for today's toughest business challenges. And here's a special tip for our listeners. Register by October 31st and save up to $900 on your registration. Don't miss out on this opportunity to expand your expertise and connect with like-minded leaders. Learn more at lean.org slash summit. Now, back to the podcast. Well, it's it's. Um, I think it's a, a part of the process that's often overlooked, which is uh, at least the way LEI tries to convey this. But uh, strategy deployment is not just about achieving strategic objectives, but developing long-term capability by providing uh, challenging development opportunities for people. And it sounds like that's sort of what you're outlining here, Otto, with what Joseph's been doing. 
And having come from the floor just five years ago, and now it sounds like you, you're leading a, a fairly large initiative, Joseph, what, what's been that development experience? What has that experience been like for you? Um, it's definitely been great. Uh, it's like almost like learning a new language, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, the the way the setup, it, I find myself that I've been doing it for a while, but not really name it as, as this. It's like a structured problem solving. I think intrinsically, everyone has that within them where they try to find a structure on how to solve things, you know, within their personal lives, within at work, uh, you know. Um, but in this case, I think having it just clearly outlines, okay, this is what I need to do. And whenever we're uh, providing training, I think we're able to apply that as well, where it's like, are we able to cover all the topics in that case? If not, how do we, uh, you know, find ways to improve? So having that outline and uh, because I work with a team and having that and making the team see uh, what I see or what mm -hmm. everyone sees, right? Bringing them in the same page, Um I think it's the biggest uh, uh, progress that, not biggest progress, but one of the big progress that we've made. Because if you have 10 team members, everyone is going to have a different perspective and aligning all of that into one and, you know, aligning 10 people to have one type of solution and try it out and improve it afterwards is, uh, you know, can be a challenging task. So uh, like what Otto said, uh, we, we have, you know, we facilitate team members. And so that's something that, we've expanded on and having the whole team have that skill I, I would say it has improved us a lot again it's that bringing everyone to the same page having that alignment um, to mm. ensure that when we provide training we're all saying the same thing and not like you know different from this person and it would be different to that um, I think that's uh, that's helped out the team pretty big big time that's one of the big benefits of the A3 process. It's not just that sheet of paper, but all the socialization that happens in the creation of it, trying to get everybody on the same page. And it sounds like not just those 10 people, but different functions, other administrative groups were coming to you and trying to figure out how can you help us and sorting all of that out. That's a, that's a big Definitely. challenge. And, and when uh, that's presented to like a leadership team, they're able to read that as well, because uh, again, they speak the same language. They're familiar mm -hmm. with E3. So, right. Everyone is in the same page of what's going on because they know, or they're familiar with the process as well. And then Otto, I assume that wasn't an accident that Joseph was assigned this, this new uh, responsibility. And as part of the strategy development process, in fact, I think you called this out in the abstract you submitted for the learning session, but a big part of it is people development and developing that pipeline of new talent. But can you share more about what that process is like and, and how you're thinking about how to include developing people as part of the strategy deployment process? I'm trying to... I'm formulating a response. So uh, I'll answer specifically in terms of Joseph, and then mm -hmm. I'll build on that. So Joseph's manager asked me perhaps a year ago, uh, she had an employee. I, tell me if I'm if I'm wrong about this, Joseph. I, I think this is, this is my recollection of how it worked. Um, more than a year ago, Joseph told his manager that he was looking for some additional uh, responsibilities and skills and particularly was interested in facilitating which is part mm -hmm. of what I do and part of how we operate strategy deployment. And she mentioned that to me and I said, okay, good, let's keep that in mind. And several months later, uh, I was in a discussion with his manager and suggested, geez, um, you've got a lot of demands on your department and you've got a finite amount of capacity people to do that work. How are you, how are you deciding what to work on and what does your strategy look like? She said, Oh, we don't have a strategy for the department. Oh, okay. Well, why would let's make one? And if you'd like to make one, we'll bring some people along in the process. Uh, Joseph and his counterpart Pima Lama, uh, who are both also interested in learning about um, building on their facilitating skills. Let me just say that because they already have, uh, you know, good facilitating skills. Um, specifically with regard to TWI and uh, and executing the training function. So uh, we then combined those two things and said, okay, we've got now uh, a need to create strategy deployment and an opportunity to develop um, some additional skills. And those two things just came together uh, and, mm. and, and, and we built on that. 
that's probably a more um, a micro answer to your question. Uh, macro answer to your question uh, is uh, several of the imperatives in 2023 made it clear that not within the manufacturing organization, but within some of the process and equipment engineering organizations, there were some skills, some controls, specific technical controls that we apply to our processes that were deployed, but not deployed as um, uh, consistently as they could be. And so that's leading us to a very likely uh, imperative for 2024 to address how will we train uh, and standardize and expand some of those uh, um, system controls to other parts of the organization, which coincidentally will very likely reference back to Joseph's team's technical training uh, strategy and how do we build a second iteration of that uh, that takes into account perhaps uh, some broader uh, organizational objectives. So, um... You know, another key piece that we haven't touched on, but you mentioned in your abstract and you mentioned a bit prior to us hopping on the podcast here is the idea of accountability. So creating objectives and setting out to achieve them. Those are two very different things. Um, can you share, I'll start with Otto, about, you know, how does that work? And is it accountability? Yeah, I guess, how does it work? What's the process behind behind that? So when I use the term accountability process, it's very specifically referencing uh, the management system as described by um, the getting the right thing, uh, creating lean culture, excuse me, uh, the David Mann uh, work and the management system and accountability process, leader standard work and discipline, the four principal elements of um of a management system. So that's in the background of my answer. Um, so once the imperatives are outlined and the specific actions are outlined, we have a uh, fairly well-defined, it's not rigid per se, but fairly well-defined accountability process that we follow that includes uh, each of the imperative leaders getting together with their counterparts and showing the details and the measurable objectives for each of their imperatives and the specific actions associated with those imperatives. So we do that early in the year and that establishes the framework. And then through the course of the year, there's several different forums that we use to have each of those imperative leaders update where their uh, imperative is. One of them is the town hall meetings that I previously described where we share those objectives with employees. Uh, we also do some uh, specific accountability actions, like I said, among the uh, the imperative leaders in, in sort of a catch ball format. Uh, we do a mid-year review where we very explicitly review the measurements and the progress and what the next steps are, okay. followed up by more communication with employees. So the combination of those things, catch ball on the front end, um, updating measurements through the middle, um, a specific uh, and and fairly structured mid-year review, and then follow-ups with uh, each each of the, uh, the the operations teams following that uh, outlines that accountability process that uh, that I mentioned. And and you know plans rarely go to plan. Things always go wrong. Problems show up. And what happens when that occurs? If, if an imperative goes red, uh, is there a process for, I guess, yeah, what takes place following, following that? PDCA. <laughs> Can you elaborate uh, what, on that? Uh, at what degree, uh, to what, again, to specific to uh, that particular imperative, to what degree of, uh, of attention does it require? Mm -hmm. um, in our strategy GA3 last year, uh, we had a significant mid year, midway through the year, our industry, um, and not just global foundries, but our semiconductor manufacturing industry started to see a decline in, uh, in demand. Uh, this is across the, the, the entire industry, not just global foundries. So when we met in our mid year review, uh, we were originally planning on meeting a particular wafer delivery objective. And it became apparent that that was not 
going to happen because the demand was going away and we needed to shift our focus to uh, being uh, more focused on managing our costs. So in that case, that mm. particular imperative, we de-emphasized some of the uh, delivery metrics and introduced mid-year some additional spending and uh, cost learning objectives in that particular imperative. So the mid-year review um, and or any of the subsequent check and adjust processes really provide the visibility to that. Uh, is there a set procedure on how to do that uh like i said it, 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 it's just an, a um a comparison of you know what's the current state of the business mm. and compared to the objective and do we need to make a change which is one of the nice things uh, of course about the strategy a3 is that it requires us to confront each of those mm. uh, and having an accountability process it requires us to confront each of those imperatives and one of the questions that we ask ourselves is is this imperative still relevant is this action still relevant? Uh, do we need to make a change as a result of some changing business conditions? So that's a, a regular part of our, our process. And then Joseph, uh, how does how does this manifest in your behavior as somebody carrying out uh, the actual work involved and in, in, in seeing out some of these imperatives from a, from a training perspective? Right. Um, yeah, and in that case, uh, whenever... whenever um, team members are assigned an imperative. So in this case, we would help them uh, to, to help them facilitate to ensure that they're uh, setting up effective agendas. For example, the meetings are effective uh, and, and the topics that they're covering to ensure that, you know, there is something coming out of it. And like what Otto said, uh, they, we, we do have town hall meetings and, and on our level of imperatives, we have uh, uh, team meetings. Uh, whether that's within the month or two months, uh, but that allows us to evaluate what we have. Uh, so whenever we do re the reevaluation of the imperative, and that's to ensure that it's still aligned to what we are trying to achieve. Um, because let's say there's a change of priority within the uh, year. So, and and maybe that, that was something that wasn't part of our perspective uh, at the beginning of the year. So that would then allow us to, Again, reevaluate, assess, and see how we can deliver um, with it being uh, not part of the initial imperative. But really, um, once we have it divided, uh, we, you know, the, the key activity leaders are the ones taking accountability, checking in, and uh, ensuring that whatever um, is implemented as, as an action is uh, effective. And if that uh, and if that's the case, then it's just a continuous reevaluation of each and that that grows where it's if it's if the uh if the action is solid and it's concrete it allows us to move on to the next and whatever we learn from there we're able to apply it to that next task that we need to that the next task that we need to accomplish and maybe just kind of wrap things up here but uh you guys have been doing this i think Otto, you said 16 years some version of this strategy deployment process that sounds about right yeah and um, you know, pretty rare for a large organization to stick with uh, one particular strategic planning process for so long. But what, what would you say are are kind of critical elements to sustainment? We've had good support from senior leaders. Uh, most of the current group of senior leaders came up as uh, junior leaders in the time frame when we were starting our transformation. So they learned about those tools uh, as practitioners and as participants, now they're leading the processes. So that, that's one factor that helps us. Uh, another factor that helps us is we treat strategy deployment as a business process and uh, use it as a business process. So uh, it's, it's it's a thing that we do. It's not just how we do things. It's just it's just a thing that we do now. Uh, and through transitions of uh, different senior leaders, the process still exists. And so mm -hmm. um, we 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 have used it in perhaps slightly different capacities with different senior leaders. But the fact that we've had that again that that consistent business process through those transitions um, just um, 
it sustain is it, it's helped to sustain itself. Like I said, by I'm not sure if I'm answering the question as clearly as I could. Um, no, well, it sounds like it's not dependent on the person in charge. It's dependent on the process. That's ideal. Correct. That's that's what we're striving for and, and continue to try to work in that direction. Yes. Well, uh, thanks, Otto. Thanks, Joseph, for joining me here on the podcast and looking forward to uh, meeting you guys in person in Carlsbad next March. And thank you again for uh, helping uh, our community, the lean community, uh, learn how to do this stuff. Um, hopefully you guys will be able to uh, touch a lot of folks out there uh, come March 2024. Sounds good. Definitely. You're welcome, Matt. It's been our pleasure. Thank you very much for having us. Thanks, guys. I'd like to thank Otto and Joseph for joining me here on the podcast. You'll have a chance to learn directly from them and 25 plus other business leaders from companies like DHL, Honda, and Boeing at the Lean Summit in March 2024. Learn more at lean.org slash summit. Thanks to you all for listening.